Hi, good evening, welcome. My name is Amanda Rabluski, and I'm the coordinator for the BCH Opioid and Chronic Pain Response Program. I'd like to welcome you all to our lecture on undoing the damage of childhood trauma. Thank you for tuning in. Um, I wanna start with a little bit of housekeeping. First, I'd like to go over the format of tonight's lecture. The lecture portion will last roughly 30 minutes, and then afterwards we'll use the remaining time for questions. Please keep your short general questions, or type, I, I'm sorry, type your short general questions in the chat box to the right of the video on your screen. We will do our best to get to them as time allows. There will also be a resource list at the end of the slideshow that we will encourage all of you to check out to gain a little more insight into the topics presented tonight, and everybody will have access to the slides following the lecture. Um, second, just again, thank you all so much for tuning in, either to the live stream or if you're watching the recording. Your support, not only for our programming, but also for your interest in learning more about public health concerns that affect your community are truly overwhelming. <clears throat> And I also want to thank those of you that left some lovely comments on your registration page. I do read them, so thank you. Um, because you're all here showing your support, I also want to be transparent with you and try to appropriately manage expectations for tonight's presentation. First off, what this presentation will not be is a cure for individual trauma histories. And it won't be an easy answer to the huge issue of childhood trauma and trauma history in general. What it will be, though, is an opportunity to learn more about what childhood trauma is, how it can affect us later in life, and how to support a young person you care for with mitigating a traumatic experience. It is a way to learn how to address something that you may be holding on to and to start a journey of healing. I want to highlight, too, that these journeys for folks are very personal and potentially painful, and they do require work, but leave you all with the message that healing and recovery are possible. So with that being said, I would like to introduce you to tonight's speaker, Dr. Joseph Uretzian. Dr. Uretzian is a psychiatrist serving Boulder County. He works with individuals and families who are coping with depression, anxiety, grief, and traumatic life experiences. He's been practicing for about 15 years. He graduated from New York University of Medicine in 2002 and completed his psychiatry training at Harvard Medical School in 2008. He's the director of OptiMind Health here in Boulder, and they are a mental health practice group that address a myriad of mental health and traumatic issues. So their contact info, as well as ours for our program, will be on the resource page at the end of the slideshow. So please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, with questions or for help. So in just a second, Dr. Uretzin will be on camera and we will get to the lecture. I, um, I would like to uh, speak uh, today about uh, childhood trauma, about adverse childhood experiences. Um, uh, and again, we can have some time for questions in the end after the, uh, after the slide portion is over. So thank you all for attending, and let's get right into it. Okay, um, let's talk a little bit about childhood and why it's important. Um, Childhood in this context, uh, we're defining as um, the first 18 years, uh, our first 18 years of life. Um, it, it is a tremendously important time, as we all know, but for many reasons. Um, it's a period that is really full of really very significant milestones in life. Uh, we, we learn how to participate in the world. Um, we're constantly learning, uh, we're developing. Uh, biologically, um, we're uh, learning lots of things. Psychologically, we're learning lots of things. Um, our brain is actively developing. Um, we're learning about coping strategies. We're learning about life skills. Uh, we're learning how to tolerate stress. We're learning how to um, connect with other people in a meaningful way. We're learning how to have healthy attachment 
uh, styles with other people. It is a critical period um, for, uh, uh, for trauma, that is to say, because we are so vulnerable and dependent uh, during, those, during those years, um, we're particularly vulnerable to, uh, to the damage that uh, trauma and adverse childhood experiences can cause. Um, the, the dependency is really important here because at, at these ages, of course, we, we are able to develop well uh, when we have healthy relationships with uh, adults who are caring, who are responsive to us and our needs uh, as children. When we have a failure um, in, uh, in that process, um, our development can be disrupted because of uh, trauma or uh, adverse experiences. Um, and, and as such, what we wind up doing is we develop strategies to live in the world that might be temporarily useful uh, to avoid further trauma, but not so helpful for later in adulthood. Um, so uh, when, we're in, when we, we experience those adversities, um, we, we don't cope well later. We might cope well in the interim, but we don't cope well later. And our mental health can deteriorate. Um, that predisposes us as we get older um, to social challenges, um, to addiction, misuse of substances, uh, and really a failure uh, to, to reach our full potential as adults. So ACEs, uh, adverse childhood experiences, uh, are traumatic experiences before the age of 18. Um, much of the original work in this area was conducted by the CDC Kaiser Permanente studies that were uh, conducted um, about 25 years ago. Um, and later work um, actually broadened the scope um, of those studies um, to include a wider sampling of people, a wider sampling of experiences. Uh, the definitions themselves were broadened uh, to include um, additional um, uh, experiences of chronic stress, chronic adversity. Um, childhood adversity then can be of various types. Um, there are, uh, of course, there's a hist there, there can be a history of abuse. Uh, we, when, we think about, when we think about trauma and ACEs in childhood, we're thinking about uh, physical abuse, emotional and even sexual abuse. We're talking about uh, physical and, uh, and emotional neglect. Um, we are talking about dysfunction in the home. Um, that, uh, that could mean being exposed to certain uh, significant stressors like witnessing a parent or a family member uh, experience untreated mental illness. Um, we can experience uh, violence uh, towards a parent. Um, we can experience active substance misuse in the home. Um, we can experience uh, divorce or family incarceration. Um, we also talk about toxic stressors that are uh, sort of chronic uh, stressors for a child, and those can be related to um, poverty, um, gender discrimination, racial discrimination, uh, threats, bullying, intimidation. Uh, all of these we, we, we consider uh, as part of the ACEs um, spectrum. Um, one important feature uh, of ACEs is that, uh, and I really like to emphasize this, is that it's outside of the control of the child. When we experience ACEs when we're very young, um, it's very common um, to experience guilt, to experience shame, a lot of negative self-deprecating feelings, um, because we believe at that time that on some level there may have been a choice. There may have been something that we did or we were responsible or we contributed to the treatment that we received or the, or the uh, adverse experience that we, were, uh, that we, that we had, um, that we were somehow involved in that. Um, and that's of course something that is just part of the way we are as children. Um, that's a secondary process uh, and a reaction to our normal vulnerability as children uh, and our dependency on adults. Um, we have a, um, we progress through a period of, um, of pretty significant psychosocial development uh, in our earlier years. Um, so we, we need those healthy relationships with adults that are responsive and caring in order to progress effectively through <clears throat> excuse me, through those periods. 
And without those, without those relationships, those, um, uh, those, uh, uh, that process of development is disrupted. Our development can be delayed. And like we talked about a moment ago, um, we develop maladaptive strategies to cope um, that don't work well into adulthood. <clears throat> Unfortunately, ACEs are common. Um, according to the CDC, 60% of adults surveyed across 25 states um, had at least one type um, of ACE. 20% uh, of people reported that they had experienced uh, four or more types of ACEs. Um, the, the number here in terms of an ACEs score uh, is significant uh, if we're comparing similar um, ACEs. Um, the, the number here is actually more significant than the type that we experience. So for example, um, if uh, someone experienced parental divorce, um, an incarcerated family member, physical abuse, uh, depression in a family member that was untreated, that would statistically be really uh, similar to um, another person um, who in childhood experienced living with an alcoholic, experiencing verbal abuse, experiencing physical neglect, experiencing emotional neglect. An ACEs score of four, for example, uh, nearly doubles the risk of heart disease and cancer. It increases the likelihood of becoming an alcoholic by many times, 700%. It increases the risk of attempted suicide by 1,200%. Up to 1.9 million cases of heart disease, it's been estimated, and 20 mo 21 million cases of depression um, may have been avoided if ACEs were uh, prevented. Um, there are, of course, some subgroups that are higher risk and some lower. Um, some children uh, are at greater risk than others. Women and racial, uh, several racial and ethnic minority groups were at greater risk of having experienced four or more types of ACEs as well. ACEs create problems. Um, they create immediate problems um, in childhood. Um, these range uh, from biological, psychological, and social problems. Um, biologically, um, there are uh, significant alterations um, in, uh, in the nervous system, in the endocrine system, in the, uh, in the immune system. Uh, the DNA structure can even be changed. Um, psychologically, um, there is the experience of difficulty in forming stable relationships. There's changes in things like focus, attention, decision-making, learning. Uh, we can be subject to experiencing other symptoms as well, like disordered eating and depression symptoms. Socially, changes can occur as well. Um, smoking, drug experimentation, uh, high-risk behaviors, uh, early sexual activity, unprotected sex, um, suicide attempts and, uh, and self-harm. These are all increased. For adults, um, there is a strong correlation uh, between the, uh, the number of ACEs experienced and poorer outcomes later in life. Um, make the differentiation here between physical and mental health effects, but they're, they're really sort of all in one. Um, physically, um, obesity, diabetes, hypertension, cancer, stroke, and heart disease can be increased. Uh, in terms of mental health, uh, suicidality, uh, risk-taking, uh, smoking, depression, alcoholism, substance misuse, un instability in relationships, uh, violence in relationships, and finally, the, 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 the risk also that the, the trauma that we experience can actually be transmitted to the next generation as well. Um, in terms of mental health effects, um, I want to talk a little bit more about addiction uh, here, um, where um, ACEs and trauma, when we're very, very young, um, cause problems later for us, particularly if uh, some of those experiences don't get processed um, uh, during childhood or later. Um, emotional scars of ACEs and trauma can be fairly significant then um, and severe enough to cause uh, physical pain and be, re be related to physical pain and cause emotional psychological pain significantly in adulthood. Um, a couple of concepts here and that is our, our biology wants us to heal and do well. That's, that's true for our psychological selves and our physical selves. So our bodies and our minds attempt to heal. Uh, and they attempt to, they, they want us to 
they want the body and the mind really to uh, uh, come back to homeostasis, which is sort of that that middle of uh, experience of not exp not not having any significant pain and not having um, uh, unresolved uh, unresolved psychological issues. We we work towards that, but sometimes we do that in a way that um, we uh, we want to achieve those results very very quickly, uh, which in and of itself is a natural is a natural want and need. Um, and sometimes we seek comfort and distance from the most troubling, disturbing memories of childhood um, when we uh, use substances uh, because of the because of how fast uh, substances can change the way we feel and change the way we think. Um, so, in terms of addiction, um, traditionally this is thought of by some addiction specialists as the sort of idea of ritualized uh, and compulsive comfort seeking. It refers to a way to think about how we use substances, why we use substances, and what we're trying to suppress when we use substances. Uh, the human body, again, has evolved to avoid, uh, to uh, survive, I should say, hardship uh, and adversity. Um, in traumatic experiences, the energy that we would usually give to non-essential physical and mental processes is shifted to, uh, to dealing with trauma. Um, the nervous system uh, undergoes changes. Uh, it increases stress hormones. Um, it prepares us to fight or, or flee, um, uh, to react to the situation so that we do not experience further trauma uh, and we keep ourselves as safe as we can. Um, traumatic experiences uh, can remain unprocessed and uh, really not thought about in any great detail until adulthood. Uh, and um, that, of course, again, that doesn't translate well for us as adults. Uh, when an immediate threat is gone, uh, uh, usually uh, the body and, and the mind, uh, when, we, uh, when we respond to something that is stressful, um, the body starts to uh, go back to normal or want to go back to normal. So after a, a threat or a trauma is gone, the body wants to reduce stress hormones uh, and allow ourselves to uh, allow the brain uh, to go back to the usual process of decision making. Uh, you know, we we uh, collect the information that we need to make a decision, and we try to make the best decision that we can. So that's usually what the body and the mind will want us to do. Um, but um, when that fails, what winds up happening is that the body and mind uh, essentially um, um, don't allow us to go back to that baseline state. Um, sometimes even after uh, a simple provocation, um, if um, our, um, our uh, systems of hyperarousal and uh, hypervigilance are really activated and continue to be activated, um, we can't come down from that very easily. And sometimes even after uh, a minor incident or another minor challenge, uh, all of those systems are reactivated again. Uh, and we wind up going back to that uh, to that place where um, uh, where our bodies and our minds are prepared to deal with a trauma when one might not really exist um, in adulthood because we're taken back to that original place. The feelings can be very much the same as they were in childhood when we experienced those stressors. Uh, and that, of course, that activation um, increases the likelihood of physical and mental health problems later in life. Um, lasting recovery is possible. Um, we can improve our lives, we can improve our relationships, and we can feel better, we can heal. Um, ideally, this is accomplished in a lot of ways. Um, so uh, we think about this in terms of governmental, societal, personal efforts um, can be focused on preventing and reducing the impact of ACEs and childhood trauma individual counseling, trauma-focused counseling, uh, other approaches, specific approaches that are used in trauma, like EMDR can be applied. Uh, group psychotherapy is helpful. Um, social and behavioral challenges, uh, changes um, can also be implemented, getting more support. Uh, medication uh, can help reduce the, the burden of symptoms as well. Um, when it comes to organizational or governmental efforts, um, the uh, a common theme here is that you know efforts are uh, really should be oriented around uh, fostering safety, um, fostering stability, um, and nurturing relationships for children. 
Uh, this can be accomplished by uh, sponsoring relationship education. Um, organizations can uh, you know, engage in sponsoring uh, community events to, uh, uh, to learn uh, about uh, family education, uh, uh, coaching on child rearing, uh, stress management. Um, larger organizations can also support community and social strategies. Um, in that, um, you know, uh, making trauma-informed trainings, for example, available, something like what we're doing here today, um, to disseminate um, uh, resources on adverse childhood experiences uh, and dealing with trauma, um, and uh, working really to uh, address uh, address risk in populations, higher risk populations, and the vulnerabilities they face. This is not a small problem. This is a large problem. Um, but at the organizational and governmental level, um, efforts can really be placed here in helping uh, to improve, uh, uh, to reduce uh, toxic stress, uh, things like increasing housing stability, for example, um, increasing social safety nets for our most vulnerable. Community uh, and family efforts um, are organized around, generally speaking, uh, fostering relationships with caring adults for children. Um, positive role models uh, are very important uh, for children to prevent ACEs from occurring and also reduce the impact that ACEs ultimately have uh, on children. Mentoring and after-school programs uh, can be useful uh, to strengthen uh, leadership skills, academic and behavioral skills, uh, to improve resiliency in kids, uh, and to enhance recovery uh, from ACEs as well. Adult supervision is really important for children who are at risk for experiencing ACEs or have experienced ACEs. Um, there is a, sort of a critical time between 3 and 6 p.m. Uh, when youth crime and violence tends to peak. Uh, supervision at these times by, again, responsible, caring, responsive adults um, will reduce uh, the risk of ACEs and reduce, will reduce the um, intensity of those experiences for children who have them. Family members um, can uh, also be involved uh, to reduce the burden uh, of trauma and stress in children and at-risk families. No one who's had <clears throat> trauma or ACEs um, is irreparably damaged. Um, we can heal from ACEs and start the healing process um, at any age. Um, and uh, with regard to children and adolescents, uh, again, uh, having uh, positive role models, uh, making positive role models available for those children can strengthen life skills. Um, we can adapt, um, uh, help children adapt uh, essentially uh, to the challenges that they uh, they have uh, and uh, and overcome those challenges and thrive in the face of adversity um, consistency uh, in adults consistent support of adults uh, can help children develop trust not only in themselves uh, but in others uh, their own abilities uh, and the healing process can be enhanced that way in, in adulthood, middle adulthood, um, we can uh, work with a counselor who has experience in trauma, in addictions, um, in depression or anxiety, um, to understand, to learn more about ACEs and learn how adversity in our own childhoods has, effect, has affected us uh, in adulthood. Uh, in that process, as we begin to build insight, learn about that process, we, we begin the healing process there. Uh, that's, that's part of the healing process, is to learn about how those experiences have affected us. Uh, and then ultimately, as that insight increases, um, we develop better and better tools to manage uh, the experiences or the residue of those experiences in adulthood. Being in nurturing and safe relationships as adults uh, also goes a long way uh, in supporting that growth, in supporting recovery from the damaging effects of ACEs. Um, if we spend time and energy in to learning um, how to better communicate emotional content, feelings, um, how to engage with others, and how to develop better relationships with other people, uh, this will also help reduce uh, a sense of helplessness, guilt, and shame that commonly accompanies uh, ACEs and trauma. <clears throat> In older age, older adulthood, um, we have the opportunity sometimes um, to reflect and ask questions 
um, that we may have uh, been unable to uh, for whatever reason earlier on in life. Uh, sometimes we have more time, um, we have more curiosity. Sometimes the impact and the burden of ACEs and childhood trauma um, uh, is, uh, feels a little less intense at, at certain times as we get older or can, and we sometimes want to use that opportunity to learn more um, about the experience and learn, importantly, how to uh, influence others so that they don't experience uh, ACEs or they uh, experience less intensity from the trauma that they may or the adversity that they may have faced. We can get involved uh, in community efforts and social efforts uh, with organizations that uh, help to disseminate information about ACEs, about trauma, learn how to prevent it, uh, to reduce the risk uh, of the effects uh, of trauma and ACEs. Uh, we can volunteer. Um, we can uh, get involved in community advocacy. Um, this is, it's really important that if we do have the ability to get involved, that we can get involved, that we do get involved, um, and we can um, improve um, uh, healing and resiliency for other people. Uh, when we help younger adults uh, navigate the difficulties uh, that they're faced with, um, that uh, you know may be related to addictions uh, that they're facing, uh, access to mental health care, um, the challenges involved in parenting, um, it really helps us to, uh, to have, a, have a, a sense for ourselves, a sense of integrity and generativity as we move forward, uh, particularly uh, in older age. We can um, get help from a professional uh, who has experience in trauma, addiction, uh, depression, or anxiety. Um, we can, uh, you know, get engaged in treatments that are effective uh, for um, uh, for these types of challenges. Um, all of the all of the approaches to addiction or mental health challenges associated with trauma uh, demand uh, that people are treated with respect in the process. Uh, we want to avoid, as practitioners, as people who help people um, navigate these challenges, uh, avoid uh, the shame and the guilt. Uh, and the blaming that can happen uh, when someone is navigating uh, these challenges in adulthood. Uh, we listen closely for how uh, trauma was experienced. Um, you know, uh, trauma can be experienced in different ways by different people, even if the circumstances are similar. So as, as providers, what we, you know, what we have to do uh, is really listen closely to how an adversity or a trauma in childhood was experienced. Um, and we, we want to look close enough into that to really understand what the disturbance means specifically for that person, what the heart of that disturbance is, uh, so that we can begin to build meaning around the experience and heal from it. Um, we holistically review biological, psychological, and social strategies for healing. Uh, some things are helpful for, uh, for folks at all ages. Uh, meditation, um, physical exercise, getting out, getting outdoors, spending time in nature, uh, pursuing uh, endeavors of interest, um, uh, finding meaningful work or uh, a way to volunteer meaningfully in the community. Um, so again, this, we, we've tried to cover a, lo uh, you know, a lot of material here, um, and uh, some of it is very abstract. Um, the healing process is an abstract thing also. Uh, and what we want to do is, we, you know, I, I'd really like to emphasize that, you know, um, we measure healing in different ways. All of us measure healing in different ways. Um, there are some commonalities, though, to healing overall um, that, you know, I think are important to, uh, to keep in mind. Um, if we're able to work consistently, if we're able to love and help others, um, if we're able to be productive uh, in our lives, uh, and if we're able to see the value in working to strive problems that affect us all, um, I think at that point, if we can do even, even just a couple of those things, um, we can be satisfied that we have significantly overcome adversities, uh, our personal adversities, uh, and are really endeavoring to, to live well. Um, so that's, the, that's sort of the, uh, the idea that I'd like to leave you all with. We have some resources here as well uh, that people may uh, be interested in pursuing a little bit further.
wonder if we have some time for questions then. <clears throat> Excuse me, we do. Thank you so much. Um, uh, before we get to questions, I just want to highlight a couple of the bullet points on the resource page here. I had forgot to give a quick explanation of the Opioid and Chronic Pain Response Program. We exist as part of BCH to help folks navigate resources for um, substance abuse or chronic pain management. So please visit our website, uh, reach out for more information. Um, and then again, the contact info for OptiMind Health is right below that, and then just some additional community resources as well. So um, let's start with the questions. Dr. Yaretsian, is there any relationship or correlation between ACEs and speech impediments or other disabilities that you're aware of? ACEs, thanks very much for that question. Um, there are, I think, complex relationships between childhood trauma and adulthood symptoms, symptomatology in adulthood. Um, if, there, if we do have a predisposition, um, biologically, psychologically, to experiencing a symptom, um, it may entirely be possible that with trauma, with repeated trauma, uh, the expression of those symptoms can become worse. Um, so uh, this is sort of a, a broad idea, uh, but if we're at risk of experiencing uh, one thing that is particularly challenging to us, um, the risk might increase uh, to experiencing the, uh, the, the product of that vulnerability um, as increasing trauma occurs to us in childhood. Uh, so uh, the short answer is it's, it's a complicated answer, uh, really, to that question. Uh, but certainly, um, as we're challenged in childhood, uh, you know, by traumas, um, the um, the later expression of vulnerabilities can can become more significant. Um, we um, vulnerabilities can be expressed uh, more intensely uh, in adulthood. Great, thank you. Um, we have another question from the audience about an adult child that had significant birth trauma that has seemed to inform that person's entire life. Would you have a recommendation for a best practice modality or just maybe the best place to start with addressing trauma that's been um, present throughout the lifespan? That's a good question. Um, I think what would be important here is to um, look at what the effect of that trauma was on the individual. Uh, some individuals may uh, look at a disability or a trauma that has been with them for an extended period of time uh, and see it as an opportunity for growth or you know, work towards uh, you know, uh, mitigating that in their adult lives. Uh, other, others may try to do that and have difficulty doing that and may need some more support around that. I think the important thing here is to make sure that we're understanding or, or whoever uh, that you're working with, um, you know, ultimately to help you through this, uh, can really understand what this has meant to you, uh, to understand the context, to understand the meaning and the emotions, the feelings that you have uh, around uh, what this, this trauma ultimately has meant for you. And with that understanding, um, it uh, you know this is it's a very personalized it's a very personalized experience. So with that understanding, you know we want to use that information to then define your goals, with what you want to achieve um, in light of having experienced that trauma, and then work on those goals uh, and don't stop working on those goals. Yeah, that it's truly a process, right? And we're Absolutely. always integrating treatment into every chapter of our lives. Absolutely. Um, okay, we're getting a lot of questions coming in now. Can childhood mental abuse manifest into stress in adulthood? When we're mistreated um, in childhood, um, we become uh, focused, uh, or we can become more and more focused on the effects uh, of that hyper arousal when we're very, very when we're very young. Uh, so if we're if we're treated poorly, um, and if it's a question of uh, emotional abuse or neglect, 
um, we tend to activate a lot of our arousal systems, um, fight or flight responses, stress hormones, and that can absolutely affect us in adulthood. Absolutely can affect us in adulthood. It doesn't have to affect us irreparably. Um, it, can, it can affect us in, in ways that are uh, challenging to overcome, but we can learn how to uh, adapt to some of, our, uh, some of our responses and our response patterns in adulthood. Uh, we have the opportunity uh, to do that in adulthood. Yeah, healing is always possible, right? Absolutely. How do you treat clients who cannot attend in person for treatment, such as EMDR? Do you do that virtually or remotely? It's it's a little bit more challenging to do uh, uh, more in-depth, hands-on kinds of uh, kinds of approaches, uh, psychological testing, some other, uh, you know, some other um, procedural uh, kind of uh, treatments. Uh, if we're not um, in in session face to face. Uh, but it can it can certainly be possible to have some elements uh, of those approaches in a remote setting. Yeah, there's definitely things that don't translate well to the virtual platform, right? Right. What do you know about brain spotting, and would you recommend it? Um, so um, there's uh, you know there are a lot of different kinds of approaches um, to you know approaching trauma uh, and approaching. Uh, challenges, adversities that we experience uh, in adulthood as a result of childhood trauma. Um, there, what I want to emphasize here is that there are a lot of really terrific skill, uh, skill sets that we can develop, a lot of terrific therapies that we can apply, um, a lot of techniques, you know, um, uh, that can be used. But what's really important here is that this is not a one-size-fits-all kind of situation. Uh, so um, kind of want to get away from thinking about this in terms of, you know, we can use this modality or just this modality or that modality or that medicine or that approach or that psychological treatment to sort of broadly m help one person or another person. This is really an individualized experience. Um, two children who have exactly the same traumas and exactly the same situation upbringing uh, will experience that trauma in sometimes vastly different ways. And so the important thing here is to really kind of understand what the trauma meant for that person and then develop a treatment plan that's helpful for that person as well. Yeah, definitely an individual journey, as with most um, mental health, substance abuse um, struggles. Absolutely. What if you find yourself repeating abuse patterns from childhood, for example, being non-nurturing in relationships, potentially with your own children? Trauma can propagate across generations, and it often does. Um, we can work to, uh, so, you know, thanks for that, that question, because I think what's important to recognize here is that in asking that question, um, what you're saying is that you're noticing what's happening. And so that's like 80% of the challenge is that, is noticing what's happening. If you're noticing what's happening, then you're already sort of at a, at a point where you can begin to ask whether or not that behavior is actually effective for your goals or not. Uh, if you're able to observe something that's happening in real time as it happens uh, or shortly thereafter, um, you're, you're in a position to be able to make a change. You're in a position to be able to do something different, to learn a better strategy, to grow effectively, and hopefully, hopefully, break that cycle of transmitting trauma across the generations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the concept of generational trauma and vicarious trauma, are probably we could do a whole nother lecture Absolutely. on that, right? Sure. Um, there's um do you have any takes on why it's possible to experience an adverse childhood event at the hands of a parent but ultimately still love and care for that parent when we're children we need to see the environments that we're raised in that we live in as safe um, we need to do that because it's a mechanism of survival. We need to believe that a parent is safe and can be trustworthy. 
um, that translates into our feelings towards that parent. Um, it also, uh, you know, lingers as we grow to uh, to shape how we feel about another person. Um, it's a natural process to have mixed feelings in that kind of a situation. Um, we have to recognize that as uh, a need in childhood to be able to to, to want to feel um, n loving and nurturing, f uh, uh, have loving and nurturing feelings towards a parent, even if that parent was not ideal in the way and frankly traumatizing um, when uh, they uh, were involved in the process of bringing you up. I, I think that, that that's a, a, it's a, it's a natural process to have those feelings. And it's an artifact of what we need in childhood in order to feel safe enough to grow and develop, even if it isn't ideal. Um, are you familiar with a book called Complex PTSD from Surviving to Thriving? If so, what is your opinion about it? And is there any reading material that you would recommend for um, the folks watching to learn a little more about um, trauma and how to get on a journey to healing? Sure. Um, there's a lot of really terrific resources. That is one of them. Um, I would say, you know, um, reading material uh, from sort of specialists in this area, bridging the addiction and trauma, um, you know, spheres. Um, anything by Bessel van der Kolk, uh, who's based out of um, based out of Boston. Mm -hmm. um, um, the body um, the body holds score holds the score, um, and uh, some of his work, uh, and also. Uh, Lance Dotas, um, who's a, a psychoanalyst in Boston as well, um, has written extensively on um, addiction, the addictive, uh, the, the, the process of addiction. Um, he's written a couple of books. Uh, I would say The Heart of Addiction uh, is a useful resource to pursue. Um, really terrific read, um, and uh, you know, um, has a lot of really terrific information on how to frame, um, you know, the effects of uh, addiction and trauma as well. Uh, that it's closely related to. So a lot of terrific resources by those folks. Yeah, and if I could just add a couple recommendations mm -hmm. as well, specifically about trauma, um, a book called Trauma and Recovery by Judith Herman. And um, for more information on addiction, one of the hallmark texts, I think, for our field is um, In the Realm of Hungry Ghosts by Gabor Mate. So I highly recommend both of those as well. Um, How do ACEs change the DNA, change DNA structure that can be undone? So it sounds like maybe this is a question that kind of um, goes back to when you were talking about neuroplasticity yeah. and how we can change those um, structures in our brain. Sure. Um, so DNA uh, can be altered um, and uh, chemically uh, by, by the, the longer term effects of stress hormones on, uh, you know, on cells. Um, uh, methylation, other sort of um, you know biological processes, um, you know, can be involved in that in in, in essentially the process of altering DNA. Um, so the uh, you know the the effects of that, um, you know, what we want to think about is that you know there's sort of cellular and molecular changes that happen, and then there's behavioral and uh, sort of clinical um, sort of changes that that happen. Um, what we want to focus on, you know, in adulthood is what we can do behaviorally to consistently make changes in our lives um, that ultimately will then uh, undo or cause, cause uh, you know, uh, enact the process of learning um, for us to ultimately heal, heal the damage that was caused by early stress. Um, so consistency in how we approach problems and how we deal with stress in adult life uh, can lead to biological, physical, mental changes. Um, you know, we can, uh, we can um, reduce our risk for uh, illnesses, for example, if, we, uh, if we're able to reduce the intensity of the stress response in adults, in adulthood uh, that we experience. And sometimes we experience a high level of stress response, even in situations that don't necessarily call for a high level of stress response. If we have a history of childhood trauma, if we can break that cycle, uh, we can reduce, um, you know, our risks for some pretty significant uh, health issues, uh, you know, broadly hypertension, diabetes, heart disease, um, and other things as well. So, um, 
you know, we want to focus on healing in adulthood to undo the damage uh, that we may have experienced in childhood. Yeah, repetition and like building a muscle, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. kind of. Yeah, that's it. Um, yeah. Sort of. <laughs> yeah. So um, someone has a question about <clears throat> the number of ACEs versus having one type of adverse childhood event, but yeah. if it happens repeatedly, perhaps even daily, how yeah. that kind of plays out into what you've talked about and like what manifests later in life. Mm -hmm. What can you offer on having one repeatedly happen versus uh, multiple ACEs happen throughout um, childhood and adolescence? Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Um, so if I understand correctly, then it's, it's sort of what's, what's the, what's the effect of sort of multiple recurring traumas versus say a single trauma or something of that nature, um, that may be, that may have occurred and then has never occurred. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, the greater the intensity of the trauma, um, the, uh, the more intense ultimately the effect on, on many people. Um, there's, uh, you know, again, I, I want to kind of emphasize, you know, each person will experience this differently. Um, if um, there is a higher level of intensity associated with, a, um, with an adverse experience or a trauma, um, it can affect us more intensely. Uh, if it's repeated, uh, it can affect us more intensely. If there are multiple traumas uh, of different types, it can affect us more intensely. Um, so, yes, I mean, there, there are uh, that there is a correlation there. Uh, with the intensity of those experiences, the, the repetition of the experiences, and the effects on later life. Mm -hmm. So we've gotten quite a few questions from different folks um, wondering the same thing. What are the signs to look for if you're a teacher or, you know, if you're caring for a young person or an mm -hmm. adolescent, what could be some of the the behavior changes or things along those lines to, that should put up red flags for people to maybe start um, asking questions or thinking about getting them some sort of support? Um, you know, in childhood, um, there can be a lot of different kinds of manifestations behaviorally um, of trauma. Um, while I'm not a child psychiatrist, um, what I can say on this is that um, generally speaking, um, a, a child may express uh, a, a, a lot of interpersonal and behavioral changes that first come to light. Um, so we don't necessarily see right the, the biological and the you know the physical effects first, although we may if the signs are very clear. Um, uh, if there's a, a situation where there's physical abuse, for example, physical signs may be may be clear. We may see that first. Um, there might be a situation where that's not something that, let's say, an educator in a school might see. Um, but what we might see in that situation is a behavior change, um, a withdrawal, um, a lack of uh, a lack of involvement. Uh, other, you know, sort of more direct things like, you know, truancy, not showing up for school, uh, you know, behavior changes that are atypical for a child. Um, you know, uh, usually there's, there's, there's enough consistency uh, if, if we have a longer term relationship with a child, like an educator in a school or, you know, they might see, you know, a child for extended periods of time where we might be able to observe uh, an acute change. Um, and if we observe an acute change, uh, that really should be a trigger for us to start asking maybe some questions um, and maybe looking a little bit more deeply into a situation at hand. Yeah, great. That was um, to kind of piggyback off that one. What advice or resources would you recommend for adoptive parents of children with known trauma histories? I think the important piece here um, is uh, that as adoptive parents, you know, we are able to provide a resource for that child that they would not have otherwise had. Um, and what I'm talking about here is a safe, nurturing um, environment uh, that in and of itself goes a long way um, in the healing process for uh, a child that has had uh, that adversity. Um, Learning to uh, to uh, kind of see um, and understand more closely how a child with trauma may have ultimately 
uh, responded um, to that trauma and how uh, the healing effects that you're uh, you're essentially offering the, the the healing relationship that you're offering to that child um, should really uh, create uh, a significant behavioral change in that child over the over the span of many many years. Um, in terms of resources. Um, you know, there may be, um, I, you know, I'd have to look into maybe some more specific uh, resources for that specific kind of situation. Um, but I think for, for our purposes, broadly speaking, um, you know, you're really giving a gift to that child um, because you're, you're, allow, you're, you're allowing, um, you know, uh, the child to have uh, a restorative, healthy, um, uh, caring, nurturing relationship uh, and that goes a, a real long way um, in that situation to, to help help the child really reach their full potential uh, as time goes on as they grow into adults. Yeah, wonderful. Um, kind of on the flip side of that, another question came in. If you've never felt safe, can you eventually feel safe if you didn't know what that felt like at, you know, f during those formative years, if you never had a safe space or a nurturing relationship. And I think, you know, you've kind of answered this throughout in connecting with resources and, um, you know, that healing is possible, but maybe you could talk a little bit about just how do people know that they feel safe? Yeah. It's tough to know how to feel about something if you've never felt that way about something. Mm -hmm. Um, what I can say there is that, um, our, our body, our minds want us to feel safe. Uh, they want us to heal and, and, and uh, wants us to, to really, uh, uh, to, to do better, to feel better. So, you know, what I would recommend there is that if there's an opportunity, if you do have an opportunity, uh, to, uh, establish a relationship with a counselor, for example, um, where you can um, be in a, kind of a unique situation, and that is, you know, uh, in a relationship with somebody who is trying to understand you and help you through the challenges that you're facing. In that process, we really have an opportunity, if we've never had it outside of that in any relationship, um, in any experience, we have an opportunity there to experience uh, safety, to experience uh, a nurturing and helpful um, relationship, ideally. Um, so uh, pursuing some counseling might be quite beneficial in establishing some, some baseline ideas around what a, uh, a non-threatening relationship, um, potentially a healthy relationship, could be like. Um, so we've got just a couple more minutes. Um, I'm wondering because, you know, I, I know your specialty isn't pediatrics, but maybe in general or um, kind of anecdotally, do you know at what age um, the actions of parents really start impacting their children? Kind of, you know, is it around age three, four? Is it from just the very beginning? Because we think a lot about, oh, you know, we don't remember certain yeah. things from childhood. But right. um, where would you say, if you could speak to an age, where would you say that those impacts are really starting to get solidified? That, that, that's a, a tough question. Um, I don't think that, you know, we, you know, can really make a, a hard and fast delineation of when, when it's bad to experience this versus when it's okay to experience that. Um, even though we don't remember uh, some of our childhood, um, we, uh, you know, your, your body keeps score, uh, as, as, as the book is, um, you know, titled for, you know, that's the Bessel van der Kork book, I guess. Um, so the, the issue there is that even if we don't remember, um, we um, can experience changes that can be longer lasting. Um, so, um, you know, it's really important to have healthy and nurturing relationships throughout childhood uh, because we do, you know, our body does remember uh, kind of what happened and our body does kind of encode, you know, um, psychologically, biologically, um, even in terms of our DNA, uh, you know, our experiences uh, in trauma, even when we're very, very young, can't remember. Um, so th that's a tough question to, pin to, to pinpoint a specific age. Um, you know, as children remember more, 
um, the risk is is that when there's a traumatic experience, when a child does remember more, um, there's there really is the you know because of the increased sort of psychological development in a child as they as they do get older, um, the 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 different compensations you know get to be more complex. Um, you know, um, so if a child feels that only if I didn't do this, then this wouldn't have happened. Um, those kinds of constructs, again, that are designed, you know, that are in a way an artifact of our dependencies in, in children are, are also sort of designed in a way to, you know, to affect us psychologically uh, in a way to, you know, to protect us uh, in some situations. So, you know, um, uh, it gets more complex as a child gets older uh, because the way we think about the effects of that traumatic experience get more complex. Um, and they're even more complex in adulthood when we start to uh, when we start to sort of review uh, some of those experiences and examine our memories associated with them. So it's a tough question to answer, I'd say. But certainly those resources that you mentioned, yeah, anything by Bessel van der Kolk Bessel, yeah. is fabulous as far yeah. as trauma and recovery. Um, and here's one. So we've only got just a couple minutes. So if we close with this one, I think it's very timely. Um, can ACEs be responsible for blanketed views such as racism and prejudice? And if we're dealing with someone who's racist because of ACEs, how do we open up and have that conversation? It's a great question and obviously very timely. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I go back to this idea of healing uh, from trauma. Um, what our objective ultimately is, um, is to be able to, you know, to engage in life uh, in a way that is positive. Um, we want to be able to um, help other people. We want to be able to, uh, to, to work well, to, to live well, to love, to be in relationships. Um, and that's sort of a measure of healing. Um, so if we can do that, and if by doing that we are uh, focused on some central and very important themes like equality, um, like justice, um, and uh, fairness uh, for everyone, uh, we can't help but think of some of those experiences uh, as having been the residue uh, of challenge, uh, toxic stress, and trauma. We just can't get away from thinking it that, uh, about it that way. So yes, I would say um, you know, um, working towards a resolution of trauma helps everybody uh, and helps everybody in a lot of different ways. Yeah, agreed. Well, and I think we'll wrap up with... Um, there's a, this is actually a three-part question, um, and maybe Dr. Yaretsian, again, this one might be a little hard to pinpoint, um, but is there any data about recovery successes from ACEs? And, you know, if there's a modality that proves to be better or more effective than any others? I think there are a lot of different approaches that can be useful for different people. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, some of the data, for example, on things like EMDR um, or other trauma-specific approaches show pretty good results for people. Again, when we're talking about data that's, uh, that's driven uh, by sort of, uh, you know, sort of in that way uh, with sort of modern research techniques, what we're talking about are numbers. Uh, and what we're getting away from here in this talk is to think about this as, an, uh, as a specific experience that's been, that's uh, sort of uh, encoded by that person to have its meaning that it does have uh, for that individual. So thinking about this in terms of the effect that it had on you as an individual, um, there's value in that, um, while of course there are sort of, uh, you know, uh, research proven methodologies that can be helpful um, given a, a specific kind of situation that may or may not be um, useful for you. Um, uh, certainly those approaches can be used, um, but again there's, there's a, you know, uh, there's value in thinking about this in terms of your specific experience uh, and then applying uh, applying techniques or interventions um, that may be useful specifically for you as they may be different for the other for another person for example who may have had the same experiences that you've had Wonderful. And actually, the last part of that question is a very um, good note to end on. How is stigma for aces addressed? And I can speak to that a little bit and say by having conversations like this, right, by inviting discussions about mental health and substance abuse and trauma out of the shadows and 
learning to sit in a place of vulnerability and ask for help because it's out there. There's certainly a community of people that are ready and waiting to support um, folks through these these hard, big public health and personal health issues. So um, we work on addressing the stigma by no longer staying silent about the things that we didn't talk about previously. Would you add anything, Dr. Yeretsian? I mean, I couldn't agree more. I mean, the, the important thing here is starting a conversation. Um, it, the conversation is never going to be perfect, doesn't have to be perfect. It has to get at the root of the experience for that individual. Um, and uh, if that, that person can find some resources uh, to start that conversation, to start that process, uh, then I think they're, you know, uh, that's, that's, the, that's what we should focus on. I think that, that will provide a service for that person. Yeah, fabulous. And you all can do that by, again, checking um, at the resource slide. Please reach out to us for support or questions. Uh, we have come to the end of our time. Thank you all so much again for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Yaretsian, for all pleasure. of the fabulous information. Um, a recording of tonight's lecture will be available at the bch.org slash live stream page in just a couple of days. And you all will receive a post-lecture survey by email tomorrow your re responses will be recorded anonymously, so please, please, please just take a minute to fill it out because we do make adjustments to our presentations based on feedback, and we are grant funded, so this really um, provides some strong data that we can show to our funders when um, writing some new grants or uh, reapplying for funding. So we appreciate everybody for tuning in and for giving us your feedback. And we will continue to bring these conversations to the public. Thank you all so much. Thank you.